How many of you are ready for the word? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Turn with me in your Bibles and we're going to go there to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians um, chapter 8. And as we are going to start this meeting, we're talking about knowing and experiencing God. And um, so uh, most probably in this first session, I'm going to uh, take up this, this whole session really just to lay a foundation uh, in, in understanding why that is so important. You know, I wrote this, the book, Knowing and Experiencing God, and I always tell people it took me uh, five years to write that book. And it's not because I write that slow. Uh, it, was, it was for the very purpose of, of getting people to know and to experience God. Uh, one of the things I, I, I noticed over the years in ministry, and that is that uh, a lot of people know about God. But, but true ma uh, maturity as a believer is not how much you know about God. It's about knowing Him through experience. And, uh, and that's really what we're going to look at here today. Now, you know, whenever it comes to interpreting Scripture, your Bible, whenever it comes to interpreting God, understanding God, there's a very important truth that I believe every person needs to realize, or every believer at least needs to realize. And that is that... Uh, Mere knowledge of Scripture alone, without knowing, believing, understanding, and I always add on, experiencing the unconditional love of God, will never get us to the place where we will interpret Scripture, the Bible, correctly. Now, you know, the reason I, I bring that up, and that is, especially in a Bible college situation, what we do is that we put a lot of emphasis on get to know your Bible. And as important as that is, that alone can never get us to the place where we clearly and un, uh, uh, and. and, and and correctly understand God, for instance. Now, you know, how many of you can identify with the fact that there are some people that have a tremendous gifting, they have an ability to acquire knowledge. And, we, you know, there are some people, some of my peers, for instance, it's as if they've swallowed a Bible. Have you, ever, have you ever come across those kind of people? You know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like Paul. I identify with Paul. Paul, in his writing, at one place he says, somewhere in the scriptures it says. I kind of identify with Paul more than I identify with people who know every verse and where it is and how to quote it exactly correctly. Amen. You know, some, some people, you know, like I said, some of my peers, it's like no matter what verse you think of, you just, you just mention, it kind of says something like this. Oh, it's, and they can give you the address. They can give you, they can give you and quote it in three different translations. Those are the kind of people I take on the side and want to slap them. Only because it makes me look bad. <laughs> Amen. But, it's very important for us to realize and understand that, uh, that mere knowledge of Scripture, mere knowledge of your Bible alone, without knowing, believing, and understanding, and experiencing the unconditional love of God, cannot get us to the place where we correctly interpret Scripture, interpret the Gospel. In fact, a, a preacher 
that does not know, believe, and experience the unconditional love of God cannot preach the gospel correctly. You say to me, how do you know that? Well, for almost nine years of ministry, I had a church. I preached every Sunday, but I never preached the gospel. It's quiet here in Minnesota. <laughs> Amen. I, I realized that I was, you know, people say, well, you know, I, I just preach the Bible. Well, it's, it's possible to preach the Bible and even be biblically correct in your, in your use of Scripture to connect one Scripture with another Scripture to get it to say what you wanted to say. But that doesn't mean that you're preaching the Gospel. People say, well, I'm just a word preacher. I just preach what the Word says. Well, you can be a word preacher but not a gospel preacher. And it's very important for us to realize that. Now I see that some of you guys are looking at me like a cow looks at a new gate, but that's okay. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8, let's go there, because I believe that Paul is going to show us. Now, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse, uh, verse, uh, verses 1 through to verse 3 especially, um, you're going to come across uh, Paul addressing. Now, you know, many times when Paul wrote uh, to the different churches, he uh, also, in his writings, addressed issues in the church. How many of you have ever been part of a church? Anybody here? One, two, three, four. Okay, so the rest of you will get, amen. We all have, right? Okay, let me ask you this. Those of you that have been part of a church, how many of you have ever been part of the church where there's issues? <laughs> now I see the people say, yeah, yeah, I've been part of the church. Well, you know, we all understand that in churches and in Christian organizations, there can be issues. Now, what was the issue in, in Corinth? Well, the issue in Corinth was this whole idea of food and eating food offered to idols. Now, I'm not going to be teaching on whether that was right or wrong or anything like that. Paul, in addressing this issue, says some really important things in, the, in these passages of Scripture that we're going to read. And he makes a, 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 a powerful argument that we all really need to get, grab a hold of. Because, you know, again, even, even in like a Bible college situation, what we, have, what we do as preachers is we put so much emphasis on Scripture, 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 get to know your Bible. And that is very important. So I'm not in any way taking away from that. But the problem is, is that what, how do we interpret Scripture? Through which, through which lens do we interpret Scripture? From what, from what foundation do we interpret Scripture? And that's really what's so important. So 1 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 8 and verse 1. So Paul addresses this issue. Oh, let me just, let me just uh, you know, kind of see if I can get us to understand the issue. The issue was this. In the, in the Corinthian church, like in many of the other Gentile churches at the time, uh, there were believers in, in the church that believed, that if you were going to be a, uh, a truly spiritual uh, disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're going to be a really serious Christian, then you would never defile yourself by eating food offered to idols. But then there were other people on the other side who believed there was absolutely nothing wrong with eating eating food offered to idols. Hence the issue in the church. That means there was a faction of believers who believed that you should never eat food offered to idols. And if you do, you're not really serious and that you're not really a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but on the other side, there were people who said, no, you can be a serious believer and still eat food offered to idols. Now, you know, we don't have that problem in the church today. Right? But we have our own problems. We have our own little issues that we have that we come with 
that we say we know and we know the truth behind this. We know the truth. So, of course, when you're in a church where there's issues, those of you that put up your hand that you've been in churches where there's issues, you would have noticed this. You would have noticed that the people for and the people against, both groups were people who said, we know. We understand. We have, and in many cases, we have our scriptures. And the ones for, they'll come and say, we know the Lord is, God has shown me. And I tell you what, and they'll have their scriptures. The ones against, they'll say, no, no, we know and we have our scriptures. Amen? All right. So it is into this, this situation that Paul now addresses this issue. And it starts off. Now I'm going to read out of the Amplified Version. And the Amplified, of course, is the ancient version that Paul used and all of the other guys. <laughs> Amen. No, no, not really. I see somebody look and say, really? No, no, it's not really. <laughs> Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Now about food offered to idols. He says, Of course we know that all of us possess knowledge concerning these matters. Now, let me stop there for a moment. How many of you can almost hear a little bit of sarcasm there? <laughs> Amen? I think, that, I think that sometimes we're so serious in reading the Scriptures that we don't sometimes catch. I believe that there's a little bit of, uh, maybe not, there's maybe a little bit more than a little bit of sarcasm. Because here's Paul, and he says, Now, guys, when it comes to this whole issue about food offered to idols, he says, Of course. We all know concerning these matters. So what is he basically saying? He says we all have our opinions. We all have what we believe to be the correct knowledge. And we have our scriptures. We have our spiritual interpretation of those scriptures. But notice what he then says. He said, yes, yet mere knowledge causes people to be puffed up, to bear themselves lofty and proud. Wow, that's powerful. So what Paul is coming to you and he says, hey, listen. He says, we all can come here and say, we know and we have knowledge and we, we have our scriptures. He says, but you know what? Just the mere fact that you have knowledge, he says, what that does for most people is that it will just cause them to puff, be puffed up and bear themselves lofty and proud. Now, I don't know about you guys, but you know, in, in, in the years that I've been a believer and been in church, I found that many times, not everybody, but many times people who, are, who, who have this capacity to just know every verse and where it is, and it, 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 they, I, I mean, it's like they can beat you up with that. You know, I mean, God forbid that you just paraphrase a verse. Or... or you know, say, well, it's in, 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 in 1 John chapter, and, no, it's not, it's in 3 John chapter, chapter 1, verse 3. And then they'll quote, and this is what it says. Amen. How many, how many of you have been introduced to people like that before? Amen. Yeah, I mean, I think we all have. And, and, and what he's just saying here is that, you know, when it, just, when it comes to that you just have mere knowledge, he says it has the tendency to cause us to be puffed up and to be proud. But listen to the, the next part of that verse. The next part of that verse, he says, but love, but love, affection, goodwill, benevolence, edifies and builds up and encourages one to grow to his full stature. Now, I do not believe that Paul is necessarily talk. See, there was a time when I, when I looked at that and I thought that what Paul is actually saying here is saying, you know, uh, just mere knowledge can cause people to be puffed up and proud, but, but let's be a little bit more loving and kind and, and gentle with one another. But if you, if you read the original language, the, the, the Greek language here, he, he's not just saying, hey, let's, let's be a little bit more loving. Because he says, but love, and that word love is agape. The, uh, the, the love of God. What I believe Paul is talking about here is that Paul is speaking here about the 
influence of God's love on the heart of a believer. And he's saying, but love, the agape love of God, knowing, believing in it, and experiencing the agape love of God will cause a man to grow to his full stature. What's that talking about? Will call, cause a man or a woman to grow to his full maturity. Thank you for that one, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, you said to me, how do you know this, Arthur? Well, verse 2 explains it. Let's have a, look, have a look at verse 2. Verse 2, he says, If anyone imagines that he has come to know and understand much of divine things, the Amplified says. If anyone imagines that he has come to know and understand much of divine things. Could I, could I say, when he says divine things, could I say spiritual things? Could I say godly things? Amen. So he's saying, if any person thinks that he has come to know anything about godly things, spiritual things, divine things, without love, without the agape or the influence of, of uh, God's agape love, he does not yet perceive and recognize and understand as strongly and clearly, nor has he become as intimately acquainted with anything as he ought or is necessary. Wow, that's powerful. So what is Paul saying? Paul is making a very clear statement and he's making and saying, if any person thinks that he has come to any kind of divine knowledge, spiritual knowledge, godly knowledge, without understanding, knowing, believing, and experiencing the influence of God's agape love, he says, you're still ignorant even if you've swallowed the Bible. Amen. I tell you, for me, this, this became a powerful illustration. This means that no matter how much you think that you, have, that you know about Scripture or the Bible, if you know these things without knowing and believing and experiencing the unconditional love of God, then Paul is basically saying, even though you could quote the Bible from, from Genesis to Revelation, you're still ignorant. Now, you know, I tell you what, years ago when the Lord revealed that to me, I mean, that was a shocker to me. Because, you see, for me, it was, the, the emphasis was so much on, on just, you know, just, just memorize the Bible. Get the Word, get the Word, get the Word, get the Word. And it is important. Please, I'm going to repeat this. I'm not saying that getting the Word is not important. I'm just saying it's not, it's not it alone. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, turn with me. Let's go and see. Let's go we can look at another passage of Scripture. And, we'll go, and we're going to see this now. For me, go with me to 1 first, first John, first John chapter 4. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read. Uh, and again, you know, 1 John chapter 4 is a, is a dangerous passage of Scripture for me to go into because there's so much being said there. And I can get carried away in that passage of Scripture so I'm going to try to stick with what, I'm, what I want to point out to you here. Amen. Because I tell you, I, you can get carried away in 1 John. Because in, uh, in 1 John, John is, is saying some powerful things about knowing, experiencing the unconditional love of God. Uh, notice here that he says in verse 7. Now, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm going to start in verse 7 there. Now, I'm going to read out of the old King James uh, just because the old King James for me is so beautifully authoritative in the way that it's, that it's written, in, especially in these verses. He says, Beloved, now, isn't that a powerful uh, way to, to, to address the people of God? Beloved. You know, I, I mean, beloved is a, is a word we don't use much today in our English. Uh, and, and really that term, beloved, it's not just talking about, you know, loved, like loved ones. Uh, you know, I can, I can say I know uh, Ken and Lori and, you know, I can say I love them. And they loved ones. But there is my beloved. Do you understand the difference? The difference is, even though I love them and they are loved ones, 
I'm not in love with him. She's the one I'm in love with. And there's a difference between just saying I love someone and then saying I am in love with someone. And so, you know, I can... So Paul addresses us as the beloved of God. Isn't that powerful? I mean, what he's saying is that God doesn't just see you as lovable, but that he's actually in love with you. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I am the one that God is in love with. And so are you. Mm. Amen. Boy, I tell you what, when you start to look at it like that, see, when I fell in love with Kathy, we've been married now 40, 42 years. When I fell in love with Kathy and I, and I found that she loved me, my knees didn't work properly. <laughs> I mean, it felt like my knees were actually able to bend that away. Every time she came in my presence, my, I mean, my knees didn't work. I mean, I was like, you know, come on now, you, you know what I'm talking about. So, you see, some of you are like, well, I don't know. It's, uh, you've just forgotten. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I tell you what, now, and, and if you still don't know, you just haven't been in love yet. Mm -hmm. Some of the younger ones here. Amen. So, he, say, he calls us the beloved of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. You know, I mean, you read that, and if you just casually read that passage of Scripture, you could easily come away thinking that what he's saying is, 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 is God is capable of love. You know, God is capable of loving you. But that, that term there, the word of... Love is of God. The word of is the Greek word ek, E-K, ek. Now that, that word ek can be used uh, as a preface to another word. Like for instance, uh, how many of you are familiar with this one? Ekklesia. Aha, oh, yeah, yeah. uh -huh, what's that? What, what word is that? Church. The church or church, right? So the word ek is, is, is uh, or E-K means origin or out of? Origin. Yeah. So what is, what, is, what is John saying? John is saying here, love, let us love one another. Why? For love is of God. Now, it's not, love, love is this, it's not just something God is capable of. Love is an originates out of God. God is the originator of love. So what does it say? It's saying there's no other place where we can find love. There's no other place where we can experience love. Now notice what he's going to say here now. He says love is of God. That means love cannot be found anywhere else. If we, are, if we are going to know and believe and experience love, we can only find it in one place. Right? Okay, so the next thing he says here. And everyone that, is, that loveth is born of God. Now here. And knoweth God. Or if the other translations will say, knows God. Now again, that word know or knoweth in the, in the old English to know or to knoweth, is not to know about. It is the Greek word gnosko, noskos, some, some places it's noskos. Uh, it, 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 that word there is knowledge that comes by experience. Okay? So, so basically what we can say is this. He says, he says, let us love one another for love is originates out of God. L love is not g something God is capable of. Love is who God is. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. We could put it like this. Experiences God. Everyone who's loving, who's capable of loving, is somebody who's experiencing God. 
Then the next part he says, He that loveth not, knoweth not. That's the same word. Knoweth not God. So the one who, who finds it difficult to love is somebody who's not experiencing God. So this is why it's so important to talk about that love is not something you can learn from the Scriptures. Oh, come on. I hope you guys get this. So, so love, the love of God is not something you can, can learn and accumulate knowledge about. It is something that you can only learn by experiencing the love of God for yourself. Amen. Hence, the, the knowing and experiencing God. And so when it comes to, to, to the love of God, turn with me to another passage of Scripture, and we're going to see how this fleshes out in what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to read there from verse 14 onwards. Ephesians chapter 3. Are you guys doing all right? Yeah. All right, so good. So Ephesians, go with me there to Ephesians, and we're going to go to chapter 3, verse 14, where Paul expresses what he prays over the people of Ephesus. When he, when he thinks about the people in, in Ephesus, and when he prays for the people in Ephesus, for the believers in Ephesus, he prays a certain prayer. Now, I always, I always teach these students at Caris. I say, you know, whenever you find any of Paul's writings and you discover that he's talking about what he prays about, his prayer, his prayer for the church, his prayer for people, his, uh, take special notice of what he's saying. Because Paul is going to tell you what he deems to be vitally important for the Christian life of the believers that he cares about. So in this passage of Scripture now, we're going to find where Paul expresses what his prayer is for the church at Ephesus. So let's read there from verse 14. Now Paul uh, begins this part of what he's writing. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there for, for a moment and we're going to kind of just sum this up and, be, and, and, and lay the foundation for what he's saying here. So, I hear Paul saying, he says, whenever I think about you, he says, I, I, I pray to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that He would strengthen you with might by His Spirit in the inner man. So, what I hear him saying here, he says, is that what's important for you as believers is that God would be the agent that will empower you, that will strengthen you from the inside out. How many of you can understand? So he's, he's clearly saying, I want God, and I want God to strengthen you from the inside out. Now, you know, I can remember, I vividly can remember when that, when that, particular verse became a revelation to me years and years ago. Now, I can't remember exactly what happened that it became a revelation to me. I don't remember if it was somebody that I heard teach on it or if it was just in my own private study that it became a revelation to me. Have you, how many of you have ever had a passage of Scripture that you looked at uh, maybe a hundred times before and all of a sudden it just kind of jumps and it just like, wow. It's like you, almost like you receive sustenance from that verse, you know. And, uh, and that's what, exactly what happened. And I can remember the moment that happened. As I read that, again, I realized, man, this is a key to Christian life, to victorious Christian life. And so immediately, one of the things I did 
is I incorporated that passage of Scripture in, into my prayer life. So that most of the time, not every time, but most of the time in my own private time with God, uh, I, would, I, would, I would use that verse. I would quote that verse. I would speak that verse over my life. I, I, would, I would, for instance, be in my, in my prayer closet, if you want to put it that way, uh, and, and, and I, would, I would pray, Father, thank you that you strengthened me with might by your Spirit in the inner man. And you know, when I started doing that, I mean, I, I, I received such, such strength from that. But very, very quickly, it seemed to kind of lose its luster for me. And so the day came when I was like, I was praying that same prayer, and I was like, Lord, thank you that you strengthened me, and it was like nothing. So, of course, you know, the first thing that any believer will do at that time, at, you know, and, and, and I was a young believer at that time, I thought, I said, I said Lord, what, what's happened? You know, what have I done wrong? You know, have I backslidden? I mean, why, why is this verse not got the same effect in my life anymore? And I just heard the Spirit of God just clearly say to me, Arthur, I want you just to read further. Read further on. I thought, well, that might be a good idea. So, so, I, so I, I, I went back to that passage of Scripture. So let's just read it again. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Yes, hallelujah, Lord, that's what I want. And then notice the next verse. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Okay, so, so immediately what I saw, the Lord is saying, He's saying, Arthur, yes, I want to strengthen you with my, by my Spirit in the inner man, but Paul is trying to tell you how I'm going to do it. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. So, of course, immediately my first thought was, well, uh, uh, Paul is saying at, at least you need to be a believer. You need to have received Christ into your hearts by faith, right? I mean, uh, that's an obvious place to begin. And, and so, of course, I looked at that. Well, I qualify for that. I, I'm a believer. I've received Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've invited Him into my heart. And, and you know, and I believe, I 100% believe that when any human being will receive and accept and, and, and ask Christ into their lives, that the very presence of Jesus comes to dwell within you. Amen. But then I started thinking about this and meditating upon this. And I thought to myself, this is an interesting thing that I noticed about Paul's writings. And I, don't, I don't know if any of you have ever noticed this with Paul's writings. Uh, you know, Paul, as an author of all of these different books in the Bible or letters that he wrote uh, in the Bible, it's interesting how that when he refers to Jesus in his writings. Now, I've written five books. I've authored five books. One of the things you'll notice that if you read my books, when I refer to Jesus in my writings, like e even in, in the articles that I write, things like that, when I refer to Jesus, I pretty much only refer to Him one way. Jesus Christ, or maybe the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's interesting with Paul. When you read Paul's writings, who's, he's, I mean, he's this one guy, but he refers to Jesus as Jesus in some of his writings, just Jesus. Some of his writings, he refers to him as Jesus Christ. In, in, in many of the writings, like in the books of the First and Second Corinthians, he refers to him as Christ Jesus. And then there's many places where he only refers to him as Christ. Not Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ, but just as Christ. Now, I, I, I 
I, uh, at that time, I thought, that's interesting. I wonder why he does this. I mean, he's, he's, this, he's this single individual, and yet in his writings, he has these different ways of referring to Jesus. Why would he do that? So I started studying. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to highlight when I studied and found out where he refers to him as Christ. Like, for instance, in, in, in Philippians. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. So if you go through almost all of the writings where he only refers to him as Christ, one of the things I noticed is the context of what he's writing about is Christ and him crucified. The anointed crucified. So anytime you find that he refers to Jesus only as Christ, you'll see it's within the context of what he's writing. He's, he's talking about Jesus Christ, who he is, and what he has accomplished on the cross, the finished work of the cross. Because notice what he says there. He says, he, he, he writes, he says, I, my prayer is that God would strengthen you with might by his spirit in the inner man. How? That Christ would dwell. Ah, uh -huh. do you get that? That Christ would dwell. Okay, now, think about this. He's talking not just about, you know, receiving, that's a beginning to receive Christ into your heart by faith, yes. But he's saying, I want Christ now, Christ, who he is, what he accomplished on the cross, the finished work of the cross must come and dwell in your heart. See, the, the term dwell, the Greek, the Greek definition of the word there, to dwell, means to set up camp. Or to, or to put down your ten pegs and, and put them in the ground and, and, and dwell there. Oh, you see, now I'm starting to see something here. That, but Paul is saying, he says, I, he says, I want God to strengthen you with might by His Spirit in the inner man. And so I put up my hand. Yes, Lord, I want you to. And he says, but this is how He will do it. If you will take Christ, who He is, what He, what he accomplished for you on the cross, the finished work of the cross, and you will m let that set up camp in where? It says where? In your it says your heart, right? Your heart. Now, you know, when the Bible talks about the heart, now, of course, there's like many places where the, the word heart is referring to the pump that, you know, the muscle here that pumps your blood. But most of the time, like in this case, it is not talking about the pump that's pumping your blood. It is talking about the very core of your being. The very core of your existence. In fact, what I like to do, and I, and I do a whole teaching. If you want to go on our website, you can, uh, well, I, I don't know, my, you, Kathy, you, I don't, you don't have that on the website anymore, right? The understanding the heart of man. I'm going to be reteaching that, by the way. Within the next couple of months, I'm going to be reteaching this whole understanding. I did, I think it was like a 12, a 12 CD set of 9 or 10 Hallelujah, she, she keeps me straight. I'm, I always have evangelistic things, and she'll just, she'll bring it back, you know. So 10, 10 different teaching, or 10 hours of teaching on just understanding the heart of man, just understanding that, that, that core belief, the core uh, of who you are. It's the, it's the very core beliefs within your heart. I, I, what I hear Paul is saying here, he's saying, he says, God wants, I want God to strengthen you with might by His Spirit in the inner man. But how it happens is if you and I will take Christ, who He is and what He has done for us on the cross, the finished work of the cross, and we will go and make that the object of our meditation, the object of our, our study. That means on a daily basis, 
we will take that truth and the truth of the finished work of the cross, the accomplished work of Jesus on the cross and what that means, and I will allow that to come and set up camp in my belief system. And it means that I now start to view life through that reality. Come on now. Do you see that there? And, and how do we do that? How can we do that? Only by faith. He says that Christ may dwell, set up camp in your heart, the very core of your belief system, by faith. Now notice the very next thing that he says. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that, uh, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Now, for years I taught, when I taught on, like if some, if some of you would go on my web, our website, for instance, you get some of my older teachings, you'll hear me teach and use this particular verse to, to tell people and say to the people, guys, we need to get rooted and grounded in the love of God. Until one day when I said that, the Lord said to me, but Arthur, that's not what that verse is saying. <laughs> I thought, but there, we, we all need to become rooted and grounded. He says, but that word there is not become. That you being is not become. Oh, come on. Now. This, side, this middle side, that, they're not getting it. I think they're going to get it over here. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> that, that you be... See, and as I read it, I realized he says, that you being. Now, the, and I went immediately and I went and had a look at that word being in the Greek. That word being does not mean to become. The word being means you always have been, you are, and always will be. Oh, I, see, I, I, I see what he's saying here. He's saying this. He says, my desire is that, and my prayer to God is that you would be strengthened with my, my spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you be, that you will discover something. That you will discover that you have always been the very object of God's love. Mm. Mm. Oh, what, what, what do you say? He says, you see, I'm telling you something. You, when you will start to make Christ the finished work of the cross to be setting up camp in your heart, you will start to discover. Now, why would I discover that? Well, you know, Paul, Paul says this in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, Paul says that the cross is the demonstration of God's love. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Come on now. Okay, so when you and I start to make the finished work of the cross... Our, the object of my meditation, the object of my study, and I'm going to allow Christ and who He is and what He has accomplished, those truths to set up camp in my belief system. He says, you are now exposing yourself to the demonstration of God's love for you, and you start to discover that there has never been a moment in your existence when God has not loved you. You know, I tell you, this is very important that we, that we get that for me, personally for me, this is a very important truth because unfortunately, there's a lot of teaching in the body of Christ about the love of God and that God loves believers. Now that you're a believer, now that you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, now God loves you, but before that He never loved you. That is not the gospel. I'm sorry. It's just not the gospel. The gospel is very clear that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Come on now. I can see some of you guys are looking at me strange. Go with me there. Do you, I'm going to go in Ephesians also, but I want to go and look at it in, in, the, in the Amplified Version and go to Ephesians chapter 2. Go there with me. Ephesians 2 and verse 4. The Amplified puts it like this. He says, But God, so rich is He in His mercy, because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love wherewith He has loved us. When? When did He love us? When did, when did God satisfy His intense love for you? Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses. Brother, the gospel is very clear. God doesn't love you now just because now you're a believer. God has always loved you. And you have always been the very object of God's love. And nothing you've ever gone through, nothing you've ever experienced in life is, is any indication that God didn't love you. You see, I tell you, many of us have gone through some tough times. Many of us have experienced some horrific experiences. And those experiences try to, try to convince us that God didn't love us, that we weren't loved. It might even right now, uh, be doubt, casting doubt on your faith that He even loves you right now. But I want to tell you, nothing that you've ever gone through in life, no matter, no matter how problematic it's been, no matter how difficult it's been, is any indication that God doesn't love you. Amen. You have, there's never been a moment in your existence that God hasn't loved you. Hallelujah. And that means God has never done anything there's nothing He's ever done, there's nothing He's ever said that was not motivated by His love for you. Oh, I didn't say that your love for Him. In fact, God couldn't care if you loved Him or not. <laughs> yeah, I got kind of God, doesn't, God really doesn't care if you love Him or not. But He cares about something very, very much. Do you know and will you believe He loves you? Amen. Because love is really, uh, or the, uh, the unconditional love of God, is really not about you loving God. Now, if you're finding this a little difficult, you need to get the book, Discover True Love. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I, I, the first time God said that to me, I, I, you know, I went to the Lord and, and the Lord, you know, brought me to the realization. I don't have time to teach all of that. But he, he, he used, he used that, that moment that, 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 that uh, Peter, and he said to Peter, Peter, do you, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? And I, and I was sitting on an airplane and the Lord said to me, Arthur, do you love me? And that's the day I realized that, you know, God knows everything. Now, I can put on a big old, you know, facade and say, yes, Lord, I love you, Jesus. But I knew that he knew <laughs> that I didn't love him that way. Even though I wanted to. Even though I desired to even though I would have given anything to be able to love God the way that He loves me. And that's the day He said to me, I'm not concerned if you love me or not. I mean, I, th I said, devil, get behind me. That can only be the devil. <laughs> can only be the devil that would say a thing like that. Because you see, I'd always been taught, you've got to love the Lord thy God with all thy strength, with all thy... You know, I mean, how many of you heard that one? I mean, didn't Jesus even say that? Yeah. 
under the law, he said, listen, if, if, if you want, you, you better love God. So, well, of course, I, I, many times I would dedicate my life. God, I will love you more. I tell you what, God, I will do this for you. I always translated loving God into doing something for him. And the Lord took me there to 1 John. See, you guys, it's all your fault because you're drawing stuff out of me that I didn't plan on doing. <laughs> Go there with me. First John chapter 4 and verse, verse 10. Herein is love. Oh, this is what love is. Anybody want to know what love is? Notice he says, this is what love is. Not that you loved God, but that He loved you. See, this is what, what true love, God, God's love, it's not about you loving God. It's about the fact that He loves you. See, so many of us, we have, we have tried to love God without ever really believing that He truly loves me first. First. First John chapter 4 and verse 19 says, We love Him because He first loved us. So what, 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 what God was saying to me that day is so important. I don't know who this is for here. This is kind of taking me right out. Of, this is taking me right out of what... But, but here's, the, here's the key. It's Listen. God is not concerned if you love Him or not. But He is really concerned. Do you know and will you believe that He loves you first? Because the moment you will know and then believe that, loving Him becomes no problem. Because you are only capable. Man, this, in fact, the Lord knows what He's doing. This fits in beautifully with what I wanted to say. Is that, <laughs> see, unless... Unless you can first experience His love for you, you are not capable of loving. You're not capable of loving God, and you're not capable of loving other people. Because it's about Him loving you first. You say to me, Arthur, but you don't understand. You don't know who I am. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what I, where I've been. You don't know what I've done. No, the big problem is you don't know that none of that makes any difference with God. Oh, it might make a big difference with some of the religious people you've been around. But it doesn't have... God is not about judging your love for Him by what you do or don't do. When you will receive His love, He loves you first. And if you will believe, you, it's like Kenneth Copeland says, I double dog dare you <laughs> to believe that he loves you right now just the way you are. And whether you never change. Now one thing I do know is that if you will believe that he loves you right now just the way you are, you can't help but change. And I tell you, this, I'm just following the Spirit here. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I tell you, when we under, start to understand that, that's what it means by experiencing. Now notice, how much time do I still have for this session? <laughs> I know, but give me, have I gone over the time already? No? Can I have yo, a few more minutes? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. All right, go back to Ephesians. Thank you, Lord. Are you doing, I mean, you guys, you're awfully quiet, but I remember, I remember, I remember you guys in Minnesota are quiet. I, I remember that. I remember that a little bit. Okay, so Ephesians, we go back to Ephesians. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you may discover that you have always been the object of God's life. That's my, inter that's my paraphrase of that verse. 
Okay? All right, now here. Ah. And to know the love of Christ. Oh, well, hang on. I think I'm, I've, I've, I've skipped the verse. May be able to comprehend with all saints. Okay. Okay, now, now, now I, want you to, I want you to... I know I went on a rabbit trail there in 1 John, but let, let's just come back here now. Paul's prayer is, I want God to strengthen you with might by His Spirit in the inner man. How? That Christ may dwell... Christ, who He is, what He accomplished, may set up camp in your heart. When you do that, you're going to discover you have always been the object of God's love. You with me here? All right. Notice the very next thing that He then says. He says that you may be able to comprehend with all saints. I'm going to read that. That you may be able to comprehend. Notice, notice, up until this point, you're not capable of comprehending. He says, he begins, My desire is that God would strengthen you with might by His Spirit in the inner man. How? That Christ, who He is, what He accomplished for you, set up camp in your heart, which exposes the fact that you have always been, you being rooted and grounded in the love of God, may be able to comprehend with all saints. That means if, you're not, if you've not come to that place where you've, you've started realizing that you have always, and you believe that God has loved you from the very beginning. In fact, God has loved you from before the foundation of the world, the scripture says. You're still not able to comprehend. That word there, comprehend, is the Greek word, means to appropriate, take to yourself with beneficial effect. Comprehending truth, comprehending God, comprehending Scripture, comprehending the Gospel only comes once you are convinced in your heart that you're the very object of God's love. Now you can comprehend with all saints. What is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height? What is that talking about? It's talking about seeing things in its full capacity. That you, now, that you might be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the, the length, the depth, the height. To know the love of Christ. Now watch, get ready for this one. Which passes knowledge. Oh. Oh, did you guys get that? What did I start off with? I started off with saying knowledge of Scripture alone without experiencing, believing in the unconditional love of God can never get us to the place where we correctly can interpret Scripture or even to interpret God for that matter. What is he saying here? He's saying the exact same thing. What he's saying here is that that, that I, want, I want God to strengthen you with my by spirit in the inner man. How? That Christ, who He is and what He has accomplished on the cross, the finished work of the cross, it might set up camp in your belief system that you might discover that you have always been the object of God's love so that now you can start to comprehend with all saints the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, and to know... Oh, hallelujah. Pride. And now you can come to... Now, what this is saying is there's a place in relationship with God where knowledge cannot take you. It goes, it says, it goes beyond knowledge. Hallelujah. He's saying there's a place in a relationship with God that you can get to that you will be in a place when, where, where mere knowledge of Scripture can never take you. Did you guys get that? Yes. Now, see, some people kind of get kind of leery when I say they say, Oh, well, Arthur, are you saying that there's a place that you can get to God where Scripture doesn't matter? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that Scripture alone... Even if you swallow a whole Bible, 
even though you can quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, that, that even, and that's wonderful, and, and we'll, we'll clap hands for you. Can I, can, I, can I give you what the J.B. Phillips translation says about that? Listen to the J.B. Phillips translation. He says, now to deal with this matter with food offered to idols. He says, it is not easy to think that we know about problems like this. He says, but we should remember that while knowledge can make a man look big. He says, knowledge can make you look big. He says, but it's only the love of God that can make you grow to your full stature. It's only the love of God that can make you grow to your full stature. So what he's saying here, now, now, now get this, I'm most probably going to have to stop here because if I go any further now, I'm going to go for another half an hour. I've got to stop now, right? Okay, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Now, I'm going to end with this. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. We'll pick that up in the next session. Is that okay with you guys? Amen. Praise God. We're just going to get back into the Word again where I left off. Is that okay with you guys? Amen. So we were talking about how the importance of of not just knowing about God's love, but to actually know, believe, and experience the love of God. And, and so Paul, in uh, Ephesians chapter 3 here, uh, you know, comes and he says, My desire and prayer to God is that He would strengthen you with might by His Spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell. And we saw that that, that Christ there, yes, is that you need to be a believer. You have to receive Christ. But that Christ, what, uh, the finished work of the cross, the, the truths about the finished work of the cross may set up camp in your belief system that you might discover the depths of God's love for you that you, that you, that you are rooted and grounded in the love of God. And, uh, and then he says, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. And so I made that point right at the end there, and that is that, that there is a place in God that, that mere knowledge uh, cannot bring us to. Mere knowledge of Scripture, as important as that is, and it's, it's very important that we know the Scriptures, that we know our Bibles. But... but the, the unconditional love, discovering the unconditional love of God and then experiencing that love brings us to a place in our relationship with God that mere knowledge cannot take us. And then, and then I ended off just by reading that last part of that verse where it says that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, that's a powerful statement. He says, he says that, that we can only really experience the fullness of God and what God has for us and what God uh, wants us to have and to experience in life. Only when we get to that place where we will become totally convinced and persuaded of God's unconditional love for us. You know, I, I discovered the reality of this particular, that part of that verse. Uh, many years ago, um, some of you have most probably heard, I, uh, in fact, if you've ever watched um, Andrew's, uh, on Andrew's website, for instance, there's a, um, an interview that I did with Andrew on television where I spoke a little bit about my, my uh, a testimony. Now, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of parts of my testimony, but um, I was in ministry and had been pastoring for about nine and a half years. And uh, I got to a place where I was so frustrated with Christian life. Has anybody ever been frustrated with Christian life? Well, I got to a place where I was so frustrated with Christian life. And, and the reason I was frustrated with Christian life 
was that so much of what I believed didn't necessarily work for me. And you know, it, it, it's sad, it's sad, but the reality is, is that this is the place that most believers find themselves in. And that is that there's a lot we believe and there's a lot we see in the gospel, but we don't seem to be able to get it to work in our lives. And of course, in my life at that time, we were pastoring, Kathy and I were pastoring. We, on the outside, we looked, it looked very successful. You know, it, uh, we, had a, we had buildings, we had uh, programs, we had money. Uh, you know, we, our church, we were in a small town and our church was running at around three, 350 on a Sunday, uh, which was a, a pretty large church for the, the community that we were in. But I mean, I was frustrated. And one of the reasons I was frustrated is that I believed in, I believed in healing, for instance. I believed in healing. I believed that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. I believed that healing was part of the atonement. I had healing meetings. I had healing seminars. And, and, and it was an amazing thing. I mean, there were people who come to our healing, healing meetings and they would get healed. But me, my wife, and my children, we were always sick. We were always at the doctors. I had my, my second eldest daughter. Um, she was around, Kathy, about five, four or five years old, most probably. Maybe a little older. But she was, she was um, every, every three to four months, she had full-blown tonsillitis. And of course, uh, as, as, a, as a good faith preacher... I didn't go to the doctors in my town. <laughs> because that would, that would mess up my testimony. I would go to the next door town where nobody knew me and go to the doctors there. You know, sometimes religion can just get you to a place where you just learn how to deceive. Amen. Amen. Anyway, we'll move right along. So, <laughs> so, so this was going on. I mean, I got to the place where I was so disappointed. I, was so de I became so depressed because no matter what I did, it just didn't work for me. That I got to the place where I was so depressed that I was willing to take my life. And, and, and in that, I'm not going to get into the whole deal, I had an encounter with God. Where, where, where the Lord just really just opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, I believe that God was, was capable of good, that he, that he maybe possessed good, but I didn't realize and understand that He is good. That in order for God not to be good to me, He would have to cease to be God. And so... This encounter with God brought me to a place where, for the first time, I actually started focusing on Christ and Him crucified. Well, the day came that I was invited to go and speak at a conference in a, uh, a city in South Africa called Bloemfontein, which is in the Free State. It was about six hours drive from where we lived. And so I was going to go to this conference, but uh, Kathy and my children couldn't go with me because they were in school. And she had to stay, you know, take them to school and make sure that... They, so I was going to go on a road trip all by myself. So it was like a road trip. In those days, I used to drink a lot of Coca-Cola. So I had a two-liter Coca-Cola in my car. I had some candy bars. I mean, I was ready for a road trip. And I had a handful of, of in those days... Uh, uh, praise and worship tapes, you know, so I had these tapes of praise and worship in my car and I, I'm, I'm on this road trip and, and I'm just driving. So halfway through, I get to the free state. Now, if, I've never driven through Kansas here, but it, people tell me, you know, if you drive through Kansas, it's flat and there's nothing and it's just cornfields and, you know, well, that's kind of what the free state was like. I'm driving, I'm like, two hours, maybe two and a half hours in my trip. 
and I'm just, I'm praising God. I'm just having a good time. Of course, I'm on a high, sugar high, you know. <laughs> and I'm praising God, and I'm just having a great time on this, on this trip, you know. And um, all of a sudden, now this is in the middle of nowhere. I haven't seen a car in like an hour. Not in front of me, behind me, nothing passing me. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that two years had passed since that encounter with God. And none of us in our house had been sick. I mean, it was like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, all of a sudden, I realized, I calculated, and I calculated in my head, and all of a sudden, I just, I mean, I stopped the car in the middle of the road. I mean, just, I mean, smoke and tires, you know. And then I thought to myself, okay, well, you know, better get off the road because they, every now and then there are some of these big old trucks that haul uh, corn, you know. So I, I get off uh, of the side of the road. Um, now, of course, in, in South Africa, we drive on the correct side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the, the, the car steering wheel is on the right-hand side of the car. So as I stop and I, 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 the dust is coming up, you know, and I open my window. I don't know why. I, mean, I wanted to talk to God, so I opened my window. <laughs> so I opened my window, and I shouted. I just shouted out. I said, God! I said, two years has passed, and none of us have been sick or been to a doctor. And this is what came out of my mouth. And I didn't even believe you for it. That's what really hit me is that I discovered that for two years not only were we experiencing healing but we were living in divine health and it was the furthest thing from my mind to believe God for now of course People say, oh, you see, Arthur, you don't believe that you misbelieve God. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, for me at that moment, I was not believing God. I mean, I didn't dust myself off after that experience with God and say, okay, God, now from now on, for two years, I'm going to believe that none of us are going to be sick. I didn't, have, I didn't believe it. In fact, I was focusing on something. And, and so when, I, when that came out of my mouth, I thought to myself, how does that work? And this is what the Lord said to me. He said to me, Arthur, yes, but what have you been believing? And that's when he took me to this passage of Scripture. And he said to me, what is it that you, what have you been believing? I said, I've been, I've been believing and trusting in, in, in your finished work. I've been believing and trusting and experiencing your unconditional love. And the Lord said to me, so Arthur... Isn't healing part of my fullness? Are you guys getting this? I tell you, sometimes I find that what we're doing in, in our believing God is that we're believing in what God can give us. Come on. Instead of going to the one who is the giver. And I started realizing, and the Lord said to me, you have been focusing on my love for you. And, I, and immediately I thought, my gosh, that's true. I mean, healing is part of God's fullness. So I thought, of, I thought well, what about my finances? You see, I mean, the same thing. You know, I believed in prosperity. I believed in giving. I preached it. I mean, I tithed. I gave. But we were deeply in debt. Prospered on the visa card. <laughs> Amen. And I sat there and I started thinking, what about my finances? And I realized we weren't out of debt. But I realized we weren't as much into debt as we were two years prior. I realized 
that we were, we were much better off. We were still in debt, but we were much better off than we were. And, you know, it was like I started realizing I'm, I'm experiencing by accident almost Amen. that which I tried to have by on purpose. And, I, and, 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 you know, this is really what I started to, to discover. And I can remember, I, I tell you, I can remember the day that God finally brought us out of, of, of poverty. And that, that when God broke that poverty spirit off me, I can remember when that happened. I mean, all of a sudden, one day in our ministry, somebody that's been a partner with us, they sent us this big check for our ministry. It was just under $10,000. And that, I, when I got that check, I realized that this check was going to take us out of ministry-wise, going to take us out of debt into the black. Amen. For the first time in our ministry. And that day, the Lord started to speak to me because within, within a three-week period, that same person sent us another $10,000 check and said, Arthur, this is for you personally. And it took us as a family out of debt for the first time. And from that, that's more than 20, that's more than 20 years ago. Is it 20 years? Yes, more than 20 years ago. And we have, we, we have never been in debt again. It doesn't mean I don't use credit cards. You know, it doesn't mean I, I don't use the facilities. What, but the, we are able to use a credit card and pay it off at the end of the month. Yeah. Hallelujah. We are able to use credit cards in a way that, but as far as being in debt, I can't, re listen, I cannot remember the last time I have ever, in the last 20 years, that I've believed, trusted God for X amount of money. Can't remember. It's almost as if my, I, stay, I stay in that place. Now, sometimes I get out of that place, but m most of the time I'm in that place, I'm just focused on Jesus. I'm focused on the finished work of the cross. I'm focused on His love for me. And this is what the Lord said to me. He said to me, Arthur, He says, the day you realize how much I really love you, he says, because he says, when you know how much I love you, you'll never ask me for another cent. And I knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying, if, if you come to the realization of how much I love you, you'll realize there's not a moment that I will withhold anything from you. And I tell you, guys, I, this, is, this is a powerful truth. And it can only come through experiencing, not just knowing about God, but, but the experience of God's love. Amen? Now notice, he says here, that you might be filled with the fullness of God, now unto Him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think. Oh, hallelujah. So what is he saying? He's saying God is able to do above what you can ever ask Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Now unto Him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think, according to the power that works within you. What power is that? The power of God's love that works within you. The power, you know, when, when he says the, 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 the power that worketh within you, that's the Greek word energia, uh, it, 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 that energizes you. The power that energizes you. What power is that? It's the unconditional love of God experiencing that love. And when it starts to energize you, he says God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever even ask or think. Hallelujah. Amen. 
You see, what we've got to realize, and, and, and all of us have to realize here, and you know, this is, this is really why I, I really would encourage you to come uh, tomorrow also when we do the two, uh, we're doing two sessions tomorrow also, two sessions again tomorrow, uh, continuing this teaching as we go along. And we, we're going to see a couple of things as we go along right now. And that is that, that, that it is only when we come from the foundation of God's unconditional love and experiencing that love that we're able to interpret Scripture, interpret God, interpret the Gospel correctly, uh, interpret the, the, the purpose and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, for instance. You know, one of the things I've come uh, to, to realize uh, is that... Um, most people, most believers today still really misinterpret the scriptures and especially when it comes to the, the purpose and the present day ministry of the Holy Spirit, for instance. I noticed that people still get things so messed up. And, and, and I'll give you an example of how, how this, this came about. Um, you know, I've, I've been teaching at Karis Bible College. Uh, the first time I ever taught at ba ba uh, Karis Bible College uh, was when Andrew's Bible School was in the original, original uh, facility. And that was in, I can't remember the, the street's name, but uh, they had, I know the day I was there, there were 28 students. That's the, that was the whole Bible College, 28 students. And I taught, and so that's like going on almost 16 years ago. And so I've been teaching for a long time, but it's only in the last seven to eight years now that I've been an adjunct lecturer at uh, the college where I've been a, a lot more involved with the uh, Bible college in Colorado. And then, uh, you know, all of the schools, I don't go to all of the extension schools. I only go to the ones that invite me as a guest speaker. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, you know, the teachers, that, the teachers that teach at the school who are employed by Karis, I mean, I'm not employed by Karis in the sense that I'm not a, an employee of Karis. Uh, I'm an adjunct lecturer there, and so I go there on occasion as an adjunct, and I teach, uh, you know, my classes that I give. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, the teachers that are, that are part of the staff there, they, they get sent to to the majority of the schools. I only go to the schools that invite me. And so uh, when I come, I get involved and I listen to students and I hear how people talk. Now, especially, how many of you here are students? Let me just see. Or even, uh, even uh, alumni, if you're alumni, put up your hand. All right, so you know, you guys, when you hear, I, 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 I look at you as serious Christians, right? You guys are serious Christians. <laughs> Uh, and because you're not just, uh, you know, s Sunday church goers, that you're, you're taking out a year or two years or three years of your life to come to Karis. And, you know, this is really what really enthuses me about teaching. I'm a teacher and I love to teach. And that's why I love teaching at, at Karis because the guys that come, they, they're serious. They want to they know, you know. And so... Um, I, I, what I started realizing, the more I was involved and I, and, and I could talk to students, hear them talk. Now, here's one of the things you can do. You can always find out what is in the heart of a person by just letting them talk. Amen. The Bible says, what the heart is full of, the mouth will speak. <laughs> Amen. So, so what I do is I listen. I listen to when people talk. I listen to when I hear Christians talk. One of the things I started noticing is that I would hear Christians and believers and students, and I'm not just saying at the, at the school, but, you know, conferences that I do, I would hear people say things about uh, the ministry or the purpose of the Holy Spirit, um, and I would listen to what they're saying, and they would be very serious, and they would be matter of fact, you know, they would be like in a matter of fact way say, well, you know, this is, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing or this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I would listen to that and I would think to myself, well, I don't see it that way. I don't necessarily see it. And, but I, instead of, instead of uh, and I would never just say to somebody, well, I don't see it that way and, you know, you, you're wrong and I'm right. I'll never do that. So I thought, you know, let me, 
let me make a note of what I hear people saying. And then go find out why is it that I, that I see things a little differently. And that's when I discovered that maybe one of the reasons I see things a little differently is because I come and I'm looking through a lens that most people are not looking through. And so I would hear people say things about the Holy Spirit and then I would make a note of it and I would think about it and I would go and study it out and, you know, are they right or, or, or am, I, am I right here? And one of the things I started noticing is that most people, when it comes to like the purpose and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and many other things, their belief system is based more upon Old Testament tradition than New Testament truth. And so I started looking at a couple of things. And so let's, let's have a look here. And I, 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 I encourage you to go there with me to the book of Joel. Joel chapter, um, chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, 28. And I want to start here, especially when it comes to this this, the, the, the purpose and the present day ministry of the Holy Spirit, for instance. And why this is, why this is so important is that, that uh, as I said, I, I heard people say things. And so the Lord, uh, about, about a year ago, said to me, Arthur, I want you to take all of these things that you've looked at and I want you to start teaching on the present day ministry of the Holy Spirit or the purpose and present day ministry of the Holy Spirit from the perspective of God's unconditional love for people. And so this is, this is basically what I'm going to be doing here. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much going to, going to bring an introduction to that in this session. And so tomorrow we're going to really look at some really interesting things. Like, for instance, you know, how many people... Uh, uh, how many of you have wondered about the teaching on um, uh, the judgment seat of Christ, for instance? You know, and, and what does that really mean? And, you know, on all of us have heard interpretations about that. Um, you know, uh, what, about, what about the passage of Scripture in Corinthians where Paul talks about, you know, your works will be tried by fire, amen, things like that, uh, you know, think about, and this, these are things we'll cover tomorrow, uh, you know, things like how many of you have ever thought about, what about Ananias and Sapphira, you know, and things like that, so, so uh, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a taster so you can kind of come tomorrow because, amen, so that you, if you want to answer some of those questions, because now I would like to go and look at some of these things as the purpose and present day ministry of the Holy Spirit and to bring us to the realization that when we look through the lens of God's unconditional love, it might not be saying that what we've always believed it says. Amen. <laughs> All right, so have you found Joel, the, 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 in the book of Joel, chapter 2? Joel, I know that my, my accent, for some reasons, uh, I find that Americans find it hard that when I say Joel, that they don't seem to, what is he saying? <laughs> so it, it's, how would you say it? Joel. Joel. Just like I say it. You know, maybe it's the South. Maybe it's when I go to the South. That's what, that must be. I mean, I, I, we just, we've just come from Raleigh, in, in, you know, in, in, in North Carolina or something, all right? Amen. So, okay, so Joel chapter 2 and verse 8. Now, when it comes to the interpretation of the, the, the ministry and the purpose of the Holy Spirit, I think this is a good place for us to start, right? So, this is the book of Joel, was written 800 and 32 years, some scholars say it's 830, some say it's 832 years. So let's just split it and say it's 831 years. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So 832 years before the advent of Christ, before Christ was born on the earth, this is when uh, the prophet Joel wrote or spoke th this prophetic word. So let's go read it there. 
Joel, I'm going to read this out of the Old King James. He says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. You see, now, that's how I know I'm still a young man, because I'm still seeing visions. And I know Ken, he's already dreaming. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> amen. Sorry, Ken. I'm, I have to, you know, I've got to use somebody, you know, and I, amen. So, but, oh, did you do that? Oh, okay, good. Amen. But now, so, so here's, so this is the prophetic word that was spoken 832 years before Jesus was even born. Now, let me ask you like this. Now, of course, this is Karis Bible College, right? Now, Bible College is not where the preacher or the teacher preaches at you. It's where we reason together. We're going to reason together right now. So what that means is you're going to have to wake up and put, put your brain to work. We're going to think about some things, right? Okay, so reason. The Bible talks about Jesus reasoned with the people. So Jesus was a guy who reasoned with people. Okay, so now I want to reason with you. So, so this prophetic word was spoken 832 years before Jesus was born. When was this prophetic word, when did it come to pass? Who said that? Day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, right? When, uh, the day of Pentecost, where do we find the, 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 that? that? That's like in Acts chapter 2, right? So let's go to Acts chapter 2. So now, of course, Acts chapter 2 is after the death of Jesus. Amen. And so now Jesus lived for 33 years. So now we're talking about 832 plus 33. So that's 865, right? So 865 years right after, after this prophetic word was spoken, this prophetic word came to pass. Let's go read it here. Acts chapter 2 verse 15. Of course, on the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the upper room where all of the disciples and followers of Jesus were gathered, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, prophesying, and, and, and the people that were in Jerusalem at that time for the festive season, they all said, man, these people are drunk. You know, I mean, maybe today they would have said they high, but they just, they drunk. So, so here's, here's Peter. Peter, in verse 15, says, For these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Amen? You see that there? Oh, now watch this. He says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So now we know he's directly connecting the prophetic word of Joel to what's happening here. He says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Did you notice something about he, how he quoted that? Did you see that he kind of got the last part backwards? See, I like Peter. See, he didn't, just, he didn't just get it exactly right. Amen? He actually, he actually misquoted it a little bit. Amen. Anyway, I just wanted to justify myself again. I just, <laughs> amen. Okay, so, so here. Now, let's, let's reason again. So when did this happen relative to where we are? So 2,000 years ago, the prophetic word of Joel that was spoken 862 or 65 years before it actually happened, this scripture says, now I want you to see something, because see, I, I, I would listen to Christians. Now, have you ever noticed this with, with us as Christians? When we talk about the Holy Spirit, when we talk about the, the purpose and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we tend to own the Holy Spirit only to the church and to believers. Have you ever noticed that? 
It's like you listen to people talk about the Holy Spirit and they will talk about the Holy Spirit as if the Holy Spirit is only with Christians and in the church. Can we read this again? Let's read Joel. And it shall come to pass that I will pour out my Spirit upon all of the church. Excuse me? Oh, okay. Well, maybe he got it wrong. Let's go see the way that Peter quoted it. Peter said, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Now, this, you said to me, well, what's significant about it? It's very significant. In, in the mind of so many of us as believers is that the Holy Spirit is only in the church. It's only with believers. When this prophetic word, which was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in the witness of, of Peter, is very clear. He says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The, the word flesh in the Hebrew and the Greek is talking about human flesh. <laughs> Amen. Come on now. Now, what's significant about this and what's important for us to see about this, see, in the Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant, before Jesus died on that cross, before His blood was shed, the Holy Spirit did come upon individual people for specific purposes for a specific time. But the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that once Christ died on that cross, no longer will the Holy Spirit only be poured out upon specific people for a specific purpose, for a specific time, but that the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. Now I know that most you know, <laughs> Christians look at me, they get nervous. Are you saying that the whole world is baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, did I say baptized? Uh, did, uh, did I say filled? No. The scripture there says that on, on that day, you know, it's interesting. That word all in the Hebrew and in the Greek, really very interesting words. If you study them, you'll find out it actually means all. It means all. All what? All flesh. The Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, according to the Scripture. This is not according to me. This is not my doctrine. This is, this is according to your Bible and my Bible. And according to, but now, let, let me ask you, just quickly, if you're going to be honest, how many of you, like, look at that and say, how come I've never seen that? How many of you say, come on, but don't, but how many, I mean, hands are going up everywhere. Yet, yet it's right there and in the knowledge, we could, I could quote that. But I didn't see what it was saying. Come on now. Now what's important about this is that on the day of Pentecost, according to that scripture, the Holy Spirit was not just poured out on a select group of people. That He was poured out upon the whole world. And that means all of humanity. Now, you say to me, well, what about the unbelievers? Well, they don't know about it. They don't realize it. They don't understand it. They're not aware of it. But the truth is, the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago has been poured out upon all flesh. And what that means is that there's not a place on this planet where you can go where there's people where the Holy Spirit is not present. And what that means for me is that I, I can go to the deepest, darkest sin hole. And if there's people there, I know the Holy Spirit of God is there. And He's there to do the job He was sent to do if I would just preach the gospel. Because if you listen, if you think about this, Jesus even said this Himself. He said, no man cometh to the Father except the Spirit draw him. All right, well, if the Holy Spirit is not poured out upon all flesh, how in the world is He drawing people? <laughs> Amen. That's just me. But, you know, you listen to people talk. You listen to Christians talk. You listen to, you know, you listen to missionaries. 
I mean, I can remember listening to a missionary talking about, you know, well, you know, they come back on furlough, you know, and they go to churches and they say, well, you know, God has sent us to a God-forsaken place. <laughs> no, 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 no. There is no more God-forsaken place on this planet. There is no place where there's human beings where the Spirit of God is not. And if you and I will go there, I have an ally. Now, you see, what that does for me is that, you know, I can come here to Minnesota, to the Frozen Chosen. <laughs> I've been waiting to say that. <laughs> to the Frozen Chosen. I can come here and I can preach, but you know what? The pressure is off me. Because I know the Holy Spirit is here. And uh, of course, we are all believers here, but I don't know. They might, might, they might be people coming here who are not believers. And you know what? The Holy Spirit is going to be the one. I mean, when a believer comes in here, the Holy Spirit has already drawn him. To give you an example. Can I, can I just get an example out of my own life? You know, the, 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 the saying that says, hindsight is 20-20 vision. What does that mean? It means that when you look back in your life, there's things you can see clearly now that you didn't see clearly then. Okay, let me... I think that many of you will identify with what I'm going to say now. I can point to circumstances, situations, and moments in my life long before I ever received Christ that the Holy Spirit saved my life. How many of you are listening to what I'm saying here? Amen. Where the Holy Spirit saved my life. And I, I, and, and I, you know, I described myself, I was an uh, unsaved Philistine. <laughs> but I can point to moments, I can point to, to times in my life. Kathy can be a witness to this, that, that the Holy Spirit saved my life. At the moment when it happened, hallelujah, the moment that it happened, I said, something said to me. Something, something told me to go another way. Amen. And by going another way, I avoided an accident. Amen. Well, you see, hindsight now, I look back now and I realize there's something was the Holy Spirit. Amen. Long before I was a believer. Now, somebody came to me one day and said, well, why in the world would God save your life as an unbeliever? Because, because He loves me. And I had a mother that was praying for me. Amen. Amen. But you know, you listen to how we interpret, but because we don't see God's unconditional love, that is not just to, the, to you as, now that you are a believer, but that God loves the world. And that when the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, yes, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon believers, not only did He come upon them, He came into them. But the Holy Spirit is present with every person today. And he, he right now is doing whatever He can. Whatever opening He gets, He starts, starts digging and starts revealing and starts drawing people. And if you come and you start preaching the gospel, not your religion, but if you come preach the gospel, He will start doing the job for which God sent him to do, to be poured out upon this world. And now I know, man, I tell you, I, I can go anywhere I want to go now. I don't, I, the, there is no place where I know the Holy Spirit is, is not going to be there if there's people there. And if I would preach the gospel, if I would present Jesus in the way, the Holy Spirit will do the job and draw them. And if he doesn't draw them, I can't save them. Brother, how are we doing for time? Are we done? Any time? Can I go just one step further? Is that okay? Amen. Just, just one step further here. Hallelujah. 
Go with me there to, 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 to John 14. This is where Jesus introduces us to the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he said. Now we, we, we see here that, that 2,000 years ago the Holy Spirit was poured out upon what? All flesh. Alright, so, so we know now the Holy Spirit is poured out upon all flesh. Okay, so now Jesus comes in John 14 and in verse 15 and 16 he introduces his disciples really to the Holy Spirit introducing us here. And it says, if you really love me you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another comforter. The Amplified says, A counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby, that He may remain with you forever. Jesus comes. Now, we know that Jesus, you know, the, the, the prophetic word said, Peter confirmed it, that, that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh. All right? Hallelujah. Now Jesus comes. He now says, I will ask the Father and He's going to give you another comforter. But when He comes, the Greek there, and He will come and abide with you. That word abide means He'll come and stick with you. How long will He stick with you? Forever. So what does it say? I mean, you listen to people talk. You listen to Christians talk. You listen to how they'll talk. You know, they'll come, you know, they'll come in the morning, you know, from, from home through the traffic and they get here and they're all frustrated and, and they, somebody cut them off and they had a couple of choice words for that person. Maybe even showed him that he's number one or, or something like that. I don't know, you know. And so then we come in and we'll say, I tell you, the Holy Spirit has just so convicted me of what I've been doing. And man, I just feel so horrible. The Holy Spirit really, come on, how many of you, the Holy Spirit just convicted me, man. I tell you, I'm just so convicted of the Holy Spirit here. You know, it's like, I mean, you show, amen. <laughs> it's like I've, I've even heard people come and say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit just left, man. I mean, I've heard people talk about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is like a dove on your shoulder. Come on now, some of you heard that one, right? It's like a dove on your shoulder. And you know, I mean, if you do something wrong, he flies away. God, you know, I think this is serious stuff, I think. Because we have this idea. That the Holy Spirit will leave us. Uh, well, you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, go read what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. To grieve the Holy Spirit is not when you do bad things. It's when you will not give Him place and you will not recognize Him for who He is in your life. But I mean, I've been in services where, where, where in a big church one time where a, a lady had a little baby and the baby started crying. And the ushers came. Like the Gestapo. <laughs> Take them out to the cry room. Because we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm talking about. I'm, kind of, I'm starting to open up. This. The Holy Spirit is not that easily grieved, brother and sister. Jesus said, I will ask the Father and He's going to give you another comforter. And when He comes, He's going to stick with you. That means there's nothing you can do to cause Him to leave. There's no, there's no place you can go where God, where the Holy Spirit says, Okay, this far, I'm out of here. Hey, don't look at your neighbor like that. Amen. You, but you listen to people talk. That, that's how they talk. The Holy Spirit's going to leave you, you know. And it's caused tremendous torment for certain people. They feel they've done something and the Holy Spirit's left them and now they're left, you know, kind of alone and abandoned. Then, of course, you listen to how people talk about the Holy Spirit. And, I mean, and this is, this is something that, that you hear all the time. We talk about the Holy Spirit as if He comes and goes. I mean, I'll give you an example. You miss, you miss church, right? And then, and then 
then you meet one of your fellow churchgoers at Kroger or, or whatever your, <laughs> uh, you know, and they'll say, man, were you in church this morning? No, I wasn't. I tell you, the Holy Spirit showed up. <laughs> I mean, what's that telling you? What that's telling you is that he wasn't there, but that he came there. I can, listen, I can only give you again from my own life. I passed it for 16 years. I passed the church for 16 years. And I can, this is how we used to, used to open our services. Of course, I was a stickler for time. All right, 10 o'clock. I don't care who's in church. We start, 10 o'clock. So the mus musicians, 5 to 10, they'd get up and start tinkling on their in instruments. The, the background music starts to fade away. And then we, we, we would draw the people's attention. Okay, we're going to start the church. Either myself or one of my elders would get up and open the service. And the way we open the service is with prayer. And we'll say, we'll, we'll, we would say, let's all stand. Of course, here in America, I love, um, I, you know, I'm an American now. I've become, I'm, I'm a fully fledged American. <laughs> Kathy and I, we're Americans. But I love the American way. You know, here in America, anywhere else in the world where you speak English, you'll just say, let's all stand. Here in America? No. Let's all stand to our feet. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, is it, come on now, you know. It's like, it's like I, the first time I heard this, like, well, did you think I was going to stand on my head? You know, I know, it's, I mean, it's, it's, the Americans are just so specific, you know. It's like, <laughs> I mean, Kathy and I, we, 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 we sometimes just crack up because, because when we first moved here, we're, we're speaking the same language, but we are totally miscon miscommunicating, you know. It's like, you know, anywhere else in the world, you go horse riding. In America, horse back riding. <laughs> just in case you wanted to ride the horse on his head. You know, anywhere else in the world, you just assume they're going to ride on their back. <laughs> anyway, what was I talking Oh, it's the way we stop. So we, we would say to the people, let's, let's all stand. Let's all stand. And then we'll start the service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. Now, depending on what church you're in, if you're like a Pentecostal charismatic church, you know, you know then, the, then the people start praying with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. You know, softly people are praying. We thank you, Lord, that we live in a free country. You know, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about, right? So it's like, thank you, Lord, that we're free and we, we, we have freedom of religion. Hallelujah. And then the, the prayer changes. Devil, we bind you. Son of a God, oh God. <laughs> now, now they pray. They bind in the devil, you know. And we loose the Holy Spirit in this place. Now the devil is bound. And the Holy Spirit is now loose. You know what the Lord one day when I was, when I was doing that. And the Holy Spirit, the, the Lord just said to me, now Arthur. Every Sunday you open the service like this. You bind the devil, you loose the Holy Spirit. So who during the week goes and... Binds the Holy Spirit and looses the devil. <laughs> I mean, it's stupid, you know. Okay, so so now, so now, the devil is bound. The Holy Spirit is now loosed. Now, sorry for the praise and worship leaders. Where's that mic? The Holy Spirit. Praise and worship leader gets up and says, Now let's welcome the Holy Spirit here. <laughs> oh, now it's quiet. Yeah. Some of you are not laughing now. You must probably be those praise and worship leaders, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 
But what I'm saying is, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm making and we laughing about it. But the truth of the matter is, this is what goes on in the church all the time. And this is the mindset of people in the church is that we bind the devil. We loose the Holy Spirit. We welcome the Holy Spirit here because he's not welcome until we welcome him. Then the, then, then, then the praise and worship. And it's like, if it's good praise and worship, like tonight, for instance, at the end of the worship, we all tend to have this, whew, man. The presence of God is here. The Holy Spirit is here. So now in our minds, He wasn't here. We bound the devil. We loosed the Holy Spirit. We welcomed Him here. Then we did enough praise and worship to make Him come. That's not New Testament truth. Jesus said that on the, he says, I will ask the Father and he's going to give you another comforter. When was that comforter given? 2,000 years ago. And he says, when, when he comes, he will stick with you. He doesn't come and go. He said to me, but Arthur, what happened then? I mean, at the end of the worship, there's a tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. It's not that he showed up. You showed up. And what I mean by you showed up is that we live in a world that is so distracting. We live in a world where the, 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 the worries, the concerns of the world just takes our awareness away from the fact that the Holy Spirit is here. And of course, when we come in praise and worship, praise and worship is more for you and me than it is for Him. Because it is through praise and worship that we become more aware. Our mind is set on Him. Our hearts are turned towards Him. And we start to become aware. So by the end of the praise and worship, we now are uh, we now aware of His presence. But His presence has been like that with you 24-7. See, I'm of the, I am of the belief that, that, you, that you and I can... Can all day long, 24-7, you can wake up tomorrow morning with the sense of the presence of God through the Holy Spirit Amen. that is with you. Like you, like, let's put it this way, the, 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 the deepest experience you've ever had with the presence of God, you can, you can live in that 24-7. If you just won't allow your mind and your heart to be drawn away by the cares of this world. Amen. Man, I tell you, time just flies here. And you guys just, I mean, draw things out of me, and that's good. But, but you know, these are the kind of things, because you, you realize it's that God loves people. And, you know, we, we're going we're gonna to wrap up this, 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 whatever you can call this, a meeting. Amen. But we're going to have prayer ministers up here. And I really will encourage you. That if you're here tonight and, 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 and what I've ministered here, if, if it's touched your heart, if it's ministered to you, you know, come forward. Come and, come and let somebody pray with you. Let somebody come and agree with you. You, you, you might be here and say, you know, Arthur, I, wanna, I want to experience and I want to have the, 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 the sense and the knowing of the Holy Spirit presence with me. And, but but I'm, I'm, my mind is just so filled with fear of torment or whatever. Let somebody come and let somebody lay hands on you. Let somebody pray with you. Let somebody agree with you. You might have sickness, disease in your body. You might have troubles in your family, in your relationships. The Holy Spirit is here with you, with me right now. And He's here to do the job that God has sent Him to do. And Jesus says He is the comforter. He is the advocate. He is the standby. He is the one who comes alongside you to come and encourage you. He said, well, why would He do that? Because God loves you. Amen. He said to me, but Arthur, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know what I'm planning on doing. I want to tell you that the only reason you're in that position is because you've not ever dared to believe 
that God can love you just the way you are. That the Holy Spirit in this place, and you know what? You can start to sense that presence right now. Not only does God love you, but He loves your family. Amen. He loves your mothers, your fathers. He loves your children. You know, I find that today, a lot of parents are beating themselves over their, over their, their heads because they feel that they've somehow done something to cause their children to be either, either running away from God or whatever it is. And I want to tell you is that God loves you and He loves your children. In fact, the Lord spoke to me one time and just said to me, Arthur, I love, I love your children more than you do. But you know what? We're going to have people up here right now. And I, I want us all to stand. And you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stand to your feet. <laughs> Amen. And, and I, want you to, I want you to listen carefully to what I'm going to say here. You know, um, this is something that, I, that I've, I learned from Andrew. And boy, I tell you, once I saw him do this and say this, it made so much sense to me. He just said, you know, one of the best ways that we can yield to God and what He has for us is just to surrender. To surrender. And of course, what Andrew says, if somebody comes and puts a gun in your back, what is the universal sign of surrender? You put your hands up. So that's what I'm going to ask you, is just to put up your hands, lift your hands up. You say, well, I don't put my hands up in church. You know what? Nobody's even going to see. <laughs> Hallelujah. Nobody even cares. You just surrender to God and surrender to this reality. Father, we just come to you right now, Lord, and as we lift our hands in surrender, Jesus, we surrender to the love of God that you came to demonstrate to us. Lord, we put aside every reason. Thank you, Jesus. You said that, that, that the love of God goes beyond every reason. Every reason we could come up with why you should not love us. Your love goes beyond that reason. And so, Father, we just surrender to your love for us tonight. And Holy Spirit... We surrender to your presence. Thank you that you have come. And Jesus, you've promised us that when the Comforter comes, he is sticking with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And that there's nothing, Father, we can do, say, or be involved in that's going to cause your Holy Spirit to ever forsake us. And so, Holy Spirit, I thank you that as we yield to you and surrender to you, I thank you, Lord, that the Comforter sticks with us and that your presence becomes real to us, that we may not only know about it, but experience your presence in this place. And thank you, Lord, that darkness leaves. Hallelujah. We don't need to fight against it. We just receive the light and darkness vanishes. Hallelujah. Torment leaves. Sickness and disease dissipates. Hallelujah. Confusion becomes focus in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Weakness becomes strength. Hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you. We don't have to beg you. 
but that you came on your own accord and you have left us even as you said in, in the scriptures, you will not leave us as orphans. That we belong in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.